try to get all our Christmas hymns at this time of year in. And there's one that we hadn't heard yet, but we're going to hear it now. Because Roberta and Linda are going to do O Little Town of Bethlehem. It's a beautiful time of the year and so many things, lights and songs and decorations and, and uh, special treats to eat, <laughs> all that sort of thing. Hey Amen. Lots, lots of activity, lots of things going on. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 1 uh, this morning for just a few moments. Uh, Matthew 1, starting at verse 18, we're going to talk about Joseph. Now, Joseph's kind of pushed aside many times, and rightfully so. He's, he's not the dominant person in, in the Christmas story, and yet we, we cannot overlook his importance because, or understate his importance because he's very important to uh, the uh, Christmas story. As we read here in Matthew chapter 1, starting at verse 18, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed, to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, 
and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated, God with us. Then Joseph aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took to him his wife, and did not know her until she had brought forth her firstborn son, and called his name Jesus. Now, of course, the language is very specific and very clear as to what Joseph did, what he thought, what his actions were. Uh, much is uh, spoken here uh, in regards to Joseph and his faith and his, uh, 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 his uh, uh, being a re very responsible in every aspect of his life. Let us pray at this time. Our Father, we're grateful for a people uh, uh, such as Joseph and others, Lord, that were righteous and have been righteous to, Lord, not only um, uh, proclaim the gospel, but, Lord, to also to uh, <clears throat> uh, live a life such as Joseph did. And we're thankful for it. In Christ's name, amen. I believe it's a significant thing that as God chose Mary to be the mother of Jesus, that he also chose Joseph to be the one that would be uh, the uh, foster father of the Lord Jesus Christ to raise him into manhood. I think it's also significant that he was a carpenter, amen? It's just kind of one of those things. He was a carpenter. He was a builder. He, he put things together uh, and made things of wood. And, of course, we know the Lord Jesus uh, learned that trade. And, uh, of course, him being a carpenter, was going to build uh, the, the church. He was going to build a great thing and um, uh, be the, the Savior of the world, the Messiah. And uh, we find that all the characters surrounding Christ at Christmas time, uh, Joseph is not uh, really given that much of a, of, a, of a prominence. In fact, we, we talk about the animals probably at the uh, manger scene more than we talk about Joseph. And they're not even mentioned in the Bible. Paul Harvey says it's, they are product of leg, legend and logic is what he says. Yet the sheep and cattle get more attention than Joseph did. And so, uh, and uh, even in the hymnals, you search and you find more about the, the cattle. And of course, there, no doubt there was cattle. There's probably uh, some, uh, um, uh, you know, donkeys and, and camels and, sheep and other things that was at the stable because it was a stable. It was where uh, people uh, had left their animals so that they could go and, and get a good night's sleep and uh, to travel on the next day. And so Mary and Joseph were chosen together to be the, the parents and Joseph wasn't just some afterthought in God's plan. And think about that in regards to our own lives, that we're not just an afterthought uh, what God is doing in our lives, in our church, in, our, in our, um, the times in which we live. None of these things catch God by surprise. God is not uh, up there in heaven wringing his hands, wondering what Congress is going to do, okay? God is not like that. He's, he's not, he, he knows these things. He understands what is happening, and he's in perfect control. Sometimes we, we think uh, things are just out of control, and in one sense of the word, they are. In another sense of the word, you read the Bible and you say, hey, this is how things are going to be in these days in which we live. And we understand that Joseph was a, an integral part of what God's plan was in that day. By the way, when the Lord Jesus Christ was born, it was a time of heavy taxation, and we experience that today. It was a time of, of a, a political upheaval. We experience that as well. And uh, the Bible even goes as far as to suggest the fact that uh, when the Lord Jesus comes again the second time, uh, that things will be similar. And uh, God gives us patterns. He says, as it was in the days of Noah so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Speaking of his second um, uh, uh, coming. And uh, so what was going on in the days of Noah? Well, that says that they were just uh, in total debauchery, uh, total uh, chaos on the earth, 
uh, there was uh, uh, the man, uh, the thoughts of man was only evil continually. And uh, I think you could compare that uh, to the times in which we live. And so uh, in looking at this uh, 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 great thing that God did in bringing his son to the earth at the right time, at the right place, with the right people, uh, of being uh, Joseph and Mary. Notice something else I think that was important, and that is the, in the Hebrew family, uh, the father was the one that would bring forth the scriptures. He would teach the scriptures. He was like the, the priest for the family. And uh, even though they had a priest at the tabernacle or the temple where they would go and worship, he was the priest for the family. He would bring the scriptures to them, would teach them. And can you imagine a Joseph sitting down with the Lord Jesus Christ, the a living word of God on his knee, uh, having the written word of God uh, and uh, telling him about the, the book of Isaiah. And uh, saying, you know, it says in Isaiah that a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son and call his name Jesus. And that is you right there as he would point uh, uh, and to the Lord Jesus Christ and say, you're right here in the word of God. You are the living word of God. This is the spoken word of God. And uh, it's kind of uh, in, uh, not in the same measure, but kind of similar. I remember... Years ago, when Nathan was just a little child, and he, uh, he was all excited. He had a, a, his own a little Bible, a devotional Bible, and he would read that in the evenings. And uh, he, he came running into the living room where we were with his Bible in his hand, and he had, his, he had it marked, he has his finger on a scripture. And he says, I found my grandmother in the scriptures. And when it talks about Timothy and young Timothy and his uh, 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 mother Eunice, his grandmother Lois, and he, he knew that his grandmother's name was Lois, and he says, I found it in the scriptures. I found my grandmother in the scriptures. And he was all excited. And just think about this. As Joseph is, uh, has the word of God and he's pointing it out and says, here you are. You're, so call his name Jesus, and here you are right here in the scriptures. Uh, uh, he will be Emmanuel, God with us, and that is you. And so uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a marvelous thing. Now let's look quickly at some things about Joseph. First of all, Joseph was a loving man. We find that he was loving toward Mary. The uh, scriptures kind of draw a picture of us of a caring and affectionate man. He was a, a, a loving man toward Mary. In uh, Matthew 1, 19, it says, Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and we'll come back to that word, the just man, in just a minute, and did not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. In Max Lakato's book, A Love Worth Giving, he writes these words about Joseph. He said, Joseph finds out that Mary is pregnant and he hasn't had any great revelation yet. So what is he to think? What would you think if you were a man and you've fallen in love with this pretty young girl, you uh, do all the right things, you pursue her in the proper and customary way, you've talked with her about her dreams and y'all have a future together, a house, a family, and then out of the blue you learn uh, that this sweet girl that you thought you, that you knew so well was pregnant, newly pregnant. And you don't know who the father is, but there's one person for sure that you know that you can rule out. <laughs> so how does it make you feel? Are you angry? Are you betrayed? Uh, are you just totally uh, uh, befuzzled about the whole situation? And so this was Joseph's dilemma. And of course, the angel then came and gave him the announcement, and he had to believe the words because it was so important for him to trust in the Lord at this time. The penalty for adultery in the Old Testament was death by stoning, and this even covered the area of the engagement or the betrothal. In fact, they even had to write a, a writing of divorcement 
uh, because they were, you say, well, they weren't married yet. Yeah, but they were engaged and that required a writing of divorcement and that, to break off the engagement. And it also required that Mary would be exposed and uh, made to public shame. But even before God spoke to Joseph, Joseph did not want to have any vengeance or bitterness in his heart. And the Bible said he was minded to put her away secretly without the involvement of a judge or a jury or, or of the process. Joseph was already considering the best way to do this in a loving way to put her away privately. And so we see that Joseph was a loving man in his relationship also, not only toward Mary, but also toward the Lord Jesus Christ. We find that uh, he, he became an adopted, uh, adopted uh, uh, Jesus. There was no resentment or indifference toward him, no lack of love. We find that he adopted him, he protected him from the hatred of Herod. He nurtured him, he cared for him, and supplied the needs as the provider for the family. And he taught Jesus his own trade of carpentry. And then sometimes we find men who are willing to walk away from their, from their roles as fathers. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8, But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith, and is worse than an infidel. You know that we've learned in our study in Sunday school in the book of Matthew in talking about the Pharisees and the, and the Sadducees, but especially the Pharisees, uh, that they decided, well, you know, I can, I can get around this thing of obligation to my family. I think I can, I, I can just call it a gift. I can say I'm the, everything that I have is devoted to God. And so then, therefore, uh, I, I don't have to take care of my family and my obligations. And I can call it, as the Bible says, Corban or a gift and say, you know, that, that, uh, because I'm so spiritual, I don't, I don't have to do this thing of just the, the, uh, keeping my obligations to my family. And the Bible says that he's worse than an infidel if a person does that, does not uh, uh, hold up to his responsibilities as a, as a father. So we find Joseph was a loving man, but secondly, we see Joseph was a devout man. From the word uh, that uh, uh, said that he was a, a just man or a righteous man, our first assertion is that Joseph was a man of faith. He had his faith in the Lord. Obviously, he had his faith in the Lord. It wasn't just, we think so. <laughs> it's not a guessing game. His actions bear out his faith in what he did and in obeying the Lord. And his hope for eternity was that he would dwell in the house of the Lord forever. When he would read that psalm, as they were going to the Lord's house and would read that psalm about, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That wasn't just words that uh, he would say. It was a belief in his heart that he knew the Lord uh, as his Savior. He knew a God and followed God. He was a just and a righteous man. But not only that, we find he was young in age, probably in his middle or late 20s. We don't know for sure. We don't know that much about his age. But he was mature in his faith. For first of all, we find that Joseph obeyed God in his devotion. He explicitly followed the Lord's leading and direction. He didn't follow his own plan for his life. Uh, he wanted God's plan. And when God spoke to him in a dream and told him about Mary, uh, and uh, he, he, he said that uh, to, the God spoke and said, take Mary and Jesus and flee to Egypt for safety. And after the birth of Christ, he did that as well. Now, think about that. He was a carpenter. He had his own business. And uh, he, he couldn't just pick up and, and move and, at, at will without a great sacrifice and without making plans and how am I going to provide? How am I going to set up shop? I've got my, my carpentry shop. I've got my tools. I've got all these different things of trade. And, and now God is asking me not only to accept Mary and to accept this situation and the ridicule, 
uh, that was going to be involved, but then to flee to Egypt. Plus, uh, you know how us guys are. We don't like to flee, amen. We'd rather fight than flee sometimes. But uh, he, he said, no, I'll, I'll obey God. I'll flee to Egypt. I'll set up shop there, whatever I have to do, and the Lord will provide. I heard a, a testimony about, um, on, on the radio, I was listening to a podcast this last week, and someone had given a testimony. It was actually on a Dave Ramsey uh, podcast, but uh, someone had given a testimony about how that God would provide for the family in the future. They said, God, God's promise, he's going to provide, he's, it's going to be okay. I recall my dad saying those same words. I recall him saying uh, in a time that my mom would say, well, I, I just don't know how we're going to make it. I just don't know how we're going to pay the bills and there's just not enough money. There's more month than there is money, amen. And I remember my daddy saying more than once, many, many times over, Honey, it's all right. The Lord will provide. And do you know what? The Lord provided. Amen. And uh, in, in many, many different ways and many different avenues, the Lord provided. And so it was with Joseph. The Lord provided for them. So he obeyed God. He was a man of faith. It takes faith to pack your bags to head off to a foreign country such as Egypt with no prospects, no planning, simply on the basis that God had said so. That uh, takes uh, quite a step of faith. Then we find he was a man who was faithful in his spiritual duty. Later on in Luke chapter 2, verse 41, he sets an example for his family. He, he goes and takes his family to the temple to attend the feast. He, we read it in Luke chapter 2, verse 41. Every year Jesus and his parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. So it was, he was a regular in going to God's house and showing his faithfulness. Now, I read an illustration about a little boy that was uh, playing on Sunday morning, and his dad was uh, sat in the chair, we were eating the paper, and, and his dad said, now, son, you need to get ready and go to Sunday school. And the boy asked his father, said, well, are you going? And he says, no, but he said, you're going. You're going to Sunday school. And the little boy thought, well, thought for a minute. He said, well, did you go to have to go when you was a child? He says, you better believe I had to go when I was a child. And so as he, he, as he trailed off, he muttered kind of under his breath, well, it didn't do you any good either, amen? <laughs> so, so that, you know, that happens, okay? But Joseph wasn't like that. He wasn't going to send uh, Mary and uh, Jesus uh, to the temple he took them to the temple, and so as a devout man of faith. Notice, so not only was Joseph a loving man, he was a devout man, but lastly we see he was a wise man. By all accounts, it seems that Joseph's life was cut short. We don't know what happened. We're not given any information about what happened to Joseph. We do know this, at the crucifixion, that Jesus turned over the care of his mother uh, to John. And there's no mention of Joseph whatsoever. So we just assume uh, that uh, Joseph's life uh, uh, came to an end sometime. And we don't know. It might have been an accident. It might have been a sickness. Uh, we, we don't know what, what the case is. But we found in our own community some people that have passed on early in life, such as Jerry Love the other day. And, and we just, it shocks us. It takes us by surprise. But we never know. We never know how many days that we have. But we know this, that God has all our times in his control. And so uh, Joseph had used what time he was given here on this earth, and he had used it wisely. And so he provided for his family. He set an example for them uh, to remember. So the Bible picture of the Jewish father is one of rare beauty and great responsibility. The Bible uh, talks about the father who loves in Genesis chapter 37 and verse 4. The father who commands 
in Genesis 50 and verse 16. He's also one to give instruction in Proverbs 1 and verse 8. And also to give guidance in Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 4. He's one that trains up the children in Hosea chapter 11 and verse 3. He's also one to give rebuke when necessary in Genesis chapter 34 and verse 30. And then Proverbs 3.12 gives us a, a refreshing look at a father who delights in his son. And then also one that is pained by his son's folly in Proverbs 17 and verse 25. And then lastly, he's one that considers the need of all those in his household Matthew chapter 7, verse 10. And so there's many references in the Word of God to a godly father and what kind of provisions he makes, what kind of wisdom he has, and what his actions are to be. And so when God wanted to picture his relationship to us, he puts himself as the heavenly father. And some people have a hard time with that because they have had a no real good uh, experience with their earthly father. But I've always been convinced that God places in an individual's life, even if they have a, a father that maybe wasn't all that he should have been, we find that God gives us people in our lives that are fatherly figures to us. It might be a pastor, it might be a deacon, a Sunday school teacher. It might be a neighbor, a friend. I, I remember how my father worked so much that, that uh, uh, my neighbor would take us fishing uh, from time to time. And uh, it was quite an adventure, I'll tell you. It was, uh, it was quite comical, actually. But uh, he would take us fishing, and uh, um, my daddy never, never was able to take us fishing and, and never, never did that. But uh, God provided for us a, a fatherly type figure in my next door neighbor, Mr. Dabala. He was a great, great guy. And uh, he, would, he would take us fishing. And so God provides for us father-like figures. And he uses himself as a picture of fatherhood. And we know that God is the, is the perfect father. Our earthly fathers are far from perfect. But God is the perfect father and he uh, has us as his children. Now, do uh, uh, God's children go astray? Yes, they do. It's not a, a sign of, of a, being a bad father if your child has gone astray because God's children go astray. But we find that uh, God uses this, and Joseph is a great example of a father, and he's one of many. We have several in the Word of God, but we also have several in our lives. A people that we know that are, are good fathers, that are good providers, uh, the men of faith, strong men that uh, have principles and wisdom and a devotion about them. And uh, God has used that in each and every one of our lives. So when God wanted to teach, guide, and instruct, and train, and warm his son, he chose Joseph. And uh, Joseph was a great man. I don't know if I mentioned this or not, but Ed's going to be singing the song about Joseph tonight in the candlelight service. And what a, what a beautiful song. It, it talks about Joseph's mindset and what must have gone through his mind at the time of, of this uh, uh, birth uh, that came about, this miracle birth. I remember the days as a teenager uh, sitting in in the, the camp uh, <clears throat> down in, uh, where was it, just north of Houston, the camp that the uh, Greenwood Village Baptist Church had. And I remember Mark Lowry right next to me in the bunk next to me. And uh, if I would have known now, uh, then what I know now, I could have told Mark, he was all upset about something. Uh, somebody had made fun of him or something, I forget what it was, but he, he just was all upset. If I could have just calmed him down and said, listen, you're going to be okay. 
You know, you're, you're going to be quite famous. You're going to write this song that people's going to sing at Christmas time, especially about Mary, did you know? And, and, and it's going to be just a tremendous song. And you're going to travel the world singing. If I could have just uh, uh, calmed him down just a little bit in those days and, and let him know that it's, it's going to be okay. And so, so it is. We can say the same thing about anything in any situation it's going to be okay God's in control and uh, regardless the Bible also speaks of the wise men we talk about the wisdom of of Joseph we we haven't had time this Christmas season to talk about the wise men but but the, they were wise and came bringing gifts and uh, uh, worshiping the Lord and we too as wise people should worship the Lord in this Christmas season. Let us all stand together to our feet with our heads bowed. Our Father, we're asking, Lord, that in regards to these things about Joseph, it's a great example for us to follow as believers in Christ. Lord, we understand that he had a very unique role, a role that none of us are, are, are being asked to play, Lord. But God, you have a job for us to do that also is unique. It's, a, it's a, Lord, important as well. So, Lord, help us to find that place to uh, fulfill our role in your plan. And, Lord, we'll give you the praise in Christ's name. Amen. What number, brother? Number 89. O come, all ye faithful. A very appropriate a Christmas song. Oh, come all you faithful. As we talk about Joseph this morning, God can speak to our hearts and he can bring us to that place of faithfulness as we come to him. Come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh, come ye, oh, come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the King of angels. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Christ the Lord. Can we sing that last verse? Sure. Yea, Lord, we greet thee for this happy morning. Jesus, to thee be all glory given. Word of the Father, now in flesh appearing, Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Amen. What a joy it is to be with you on Christmas Eve. Remember the service tonight if you're going to be in town. If you have family coming in, it's a great time. Just a, a, a very, real short service, a beautiful service of coming together and hear, reading the Christmas story from the Word of God and lighting the candles and, and uh, singing together and worshiping together. And so that's what we'll do at 5 o'clock. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Brother Bob Fleming, if he would, to dismiss us in prayer, please.